Welcome to the Startup Grind. Um, but yeah, let's jump right in. If you have never met Sean before, please welcome Sean Johnson to the stage. Yeah. Hey there. Um, so how many people here know what Startup Institute is? Raise your hands. All right, so we got like half. That's great. Um, Sean, do you want to start? Before we really get into everything, do you want to just give us a quick like 30 seconds? What, what is Startup Institute? Yeah, so Startup Institute is a career accelerator that takes passionate individuals that are seeking the network, skill set, and mindset to launch into careers that they love. So we've been doing this since 2012 uh, from a startup accelerator called Techstars. Uh, I'm sure if half of you guys know what Startup Institute is, the other half should know what Techstars is. But um, you know, we started it back in 2012 from a really unique position where uh, we were seeing all these companies uh, continue to raise money, be founded, get mentorship, and all the things that is actually really, really hard when it comes to uh, building a successful company. But the biggest burden that you'll always face is growing a team that has the ability to push forward through ambiguity and get shit done. So uh, on that side, there's a ton of individuals out here, uh, pretty much in the global ecosystem that want to uh, do that effectively. So we put together this program uh, that takes developers, designers, marketers, and salespeople, uh, thrust them directly into the heart of uh, the community where they're growing their network, they're growing up to the minute skills, uh, and then they're able to transition in the careers that they love. Excellent. So before we get too much more into Startup Institute and kind of the Techstars story, um, I'd love to just kind of dive into like Sean Johnson as a person. Like, you know, but clearly you're the co-founder of Startup Institute um, and a lot of people know you for that. But like, let's, let's just like rewind the tape a little bit here. Yeah. Like, how did you first, uh, how did you first come into uh, starting your own company? Like, like when did that start? Just Give us, give us the Sean Johnson story. Give us the like montage. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you know, there isn't, you know, that much of a rocky montage, right? Like, it's not like I'm punching cow beef and then all of a sudden Startup Institute <laughs> appears. Um, you know, it was, it, it's actually a, a, an uncertain journey uh, that had led me here. So, you know, I never thought that I'd be the one to start a company. Uh, I think you find a lot of founders that'll sit in the same chair and say like, from the moment I came out of the womb, I knew I was gonna start a company and I did all these things. But um, you know, starting a company is really hard. And uh, you know, I knew that. And while I think a lot of folks are you know, of the mindset that like, yeah, you're gonna be your own boss the moment that you start your own thing, um, that's the moment where you're everybody's boss. Um, but you know, I think ultimately it was like this, this sense of responsibility once we found uh, what Startup Institute could be that just made it all worth it and you say, okay, well, um, if I'm going to be the one to start this, if I uh, will lead this, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, so before actually starting Startup Institute, what were you doing? So before Startup Institute, I was actually working at Techstars Boston. And before that, uh, I was a management consultant. So uh, I guess if you guys want montage, this would be like the pain montage. Um, <laughs> Like frustrated, like oh yeah, yeah. Like you know how the, there's always a montage, and it's like all right, these guys are in the garage, they have an idea. Then like there's a couple late nights and like Red Bull, and then all of a sudden they're counting money. Yeah, it's like the opposite of that. So, um, you know, for more or less, that was like pretty much my early career. You know, coming out of uh, university, I'd done uh, a couple of things. I'd, you know quickly worked for the government at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That was kind of a misstep. Um, and then had coupled in a lot of different things before really drilling in and a career as a management consultant. And um, you know, if a lot of you guys have thought about doing that, um, it's not for everybody. I think it's just, yeah, like I, I've got friends that are still doing it and Very like they're built for it. Personality. Yeah. It, yeah, you got to be analytical. You got to love PowerPoint. That's probably better than being analytical. You got to love PowerPoint. <laughs> um, but no, it was it was a it was a great and beautiful challenge. You know, I was doing it for about five years. It was actually longer than most people think. Um, you know, usually there's this idea of two and through. 
and you'll do your two years, you'll work for a client, or you'll go to business school, or you'll do something else with your life. Kind of burn out a little bit. Yeah, but I think for me, like a little bit, the money was good, and there was still like more to do, and you know, I just kept thinking that if I kept pushing forward, that we would stop, like get further than just like the the PowerPoint deliverable or the strategy, and actually like do the thing. Right. Um, because they were all like really, really brilliant ideas that we were working on. We're talking like internet, like changing the internet protocol versioning, okay. um, yeah. broadband infrastructure expansion, cybersecurity. Um, this is like all really nerdy stuff, but it was like what I signed up for. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's still like challenges that still exist today. Well, so draw the line for us then between management consulting, making a crap ton of money or whatever it was, and working for Techstars. Like, how did that happen? Cool. So you go back to kind of like year three, four, and then right up into five. And that was a time where I started to think like, okay, well, if I've been here longer than most people that do like their tour of duty, yeah. what am I making of this? So I started looking back in a lot of my old engagements. And um, you know, it was that, that retrospective picture that I was like, you know what, I served, I poured my heart out into these clients, you did all these things, and you would hope that looking back over the years, it's probably done, right? Like you, you left the a job well done, they probably executed it, and that's how you're gonna deliver innovation to the world. But um, not, not many of them were done. Okay. Um, and it started to get you to think that the next three years would be the same. You know, right. baby stepping in the strategy, never having implementation fully delivered. And uh, I wanted to, to find some place to do that, where I could be a part of the ideation and implementation but um, there, I didn't know where those were. Uh, I didn't know where the, yeah, like where do you go and do that? There's a ton of places where you can make widgets and then there's certain places where you can sell ideas, um, but to be able to do both is uh, actually quite rare. So, you know, I didn't want to give up the bone in my teeth for like the other like mirror image of the dog in the, okay, one guy got that. Okay, um, so you don't want to give up what you already have searching for something that you don't even know if it exists. Um, so I just started looking around and trying to no find different that, things. No. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'd stumbled upon, you know, after a little bit of journey, startups, and it, it seemed like, you know, burning bush. I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I need, like <laughs> tech, and they're building stuff from scratch, like somebody comes up with an idea and all of a sudden it's a company. Right. Um, but nobody wanted me by that point because I, I did kind of take myself as like this very management consulting person. Like, right. Yeah, like you'd, you probably bought into that mentality that you're describing. Like you say, you know, people have to have a certain sort of rhythm, a certain pattern, a certain mentality to do management consulting. You probably would transform toward that as you're part of that culture. Yeah, so, you know, the thing I'll say about working in startups is there's a specific culture that. Um, you know, part of it you need to ascribe to, and then the other piece you need to drive into the startup that you're joining. And I think there are times when you go into certain other work environments that that culture will start to wash over you, and you'll become more of a banker, or more of a lawyer, or more of a what have you. Right. And as you decide to go into a realm completely different, there's some unlearning of behaviors that you need to have. Yeah. Um, there's something out there that says, like, each person is essentially the like sum of the five people they spend the most time with, or something like that. Makes me think of that. Um, so is it, I mean, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I think so. For me, I try to hang around the most diverse group of people I can. <laughs> okay. So maybe that makes me like a little bit schizophrenic of like the sum <laughs> of me. Um, but no, I, I I definitely think like being in a specific environment, if you're adaptable, that can tend to be like a boon and a bane. Yeah. 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 So um, when you began working for Techstars, were you here, were you in Boulder, or? It was actually Techstars Boston. Boston. Yeah, so this is up in uh, Cambridge, uh, working under Katie Ray and Reed Sturdivant, who uh, were the, they, they would run the program uh, at the time. And you know, when I first was looking for the opportunity, um, you know, I was willing to do whatever it took to get on their team. So, you know, a, um, you know, a, a a previous colleague had recommended me for the position and just kind of threw me at it and was like, all right, well, it's up to you. You know, I told him that you'll be in touch, but I'm not really gonna connect you by email, which is kind of like a weird, like, yeah, like wax on, wax on, like you'll learn a lesson in it's the like struggle, Daniel-san. Yeah, so, 
Um, but I'm pretty good at Google. So, um, you know, the funny part about it is it was actually, um, you know, one of them who uh, went on to be my co-founder of all things. Um, he is extremely seasoned and had done a lot uh, in the tech community. So he was like early to blogging. Okay. And that was black when you thought the internet was a safe place to put your phone number. And, you know, the way back machine was there and I found it. And I called him and he picked up and nice. I'm pretty sure it like scared the crap out of him. But I was like, all right, like I want this job. Can I, can I work for you? What do I got to do? Da, 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 da. <laughs> and um, you know, at that point, believe it or not, I was um, you know, still in DC. Um, we got to the point where the offer came is like, when can you start? Okay. My answer was, it's Friday. I live here. I'll see you Monday. <laughs> Nice. That's probably the right answer. I mean, if the answer was, well, I'm going on vacation in like three weeks and like, how about six weeks from now? <laughs> you just work. figure it out. I mean, at, at that point, like if you see an opportunity that is so right for you, um, or even if it's not like right and you're like completely convicted, but if it has so much potential, you know, it's worth kind of dropping everything because you can pick what you drop back up sometimes. Yeah. But um. You can't always gain a missed opportunity again. So what were those first few days and weeks like working for, like, I mean, must have been a completely, completely different work environment. I was up for that. I was, yeah, I, that, that was the best part about it. It was the, the opportunity to be in a new environment, surrounded by all these people who, while I was trying to like slough off like my old self and become like startup Sean, um, you know, I'm like tweeting at these people, they don't tweet back. I'm like, you know, watching them on TechCrunch and, you know, almost to the point of like idolatry. And then to see, you know, them walk through the hallway and I'm like, oh my gosh, Brad Fell, this hair's really that long. <laughs> um, it, it was amazing. And it just every day reminded you that you had like a responsibility to be um, busting your ass every day because you were like in the internet yeah. that you used to consume. <laughs> right. That, that seems to be an interesting facet of like the startup culture and ecosystem is like your idols become your peers at some point or like all of a sudden that person that you idolized because of their blog posts or whatever, you know, everyone is so much more accessible that it's like, oh man, I've been reading like Fred Wilson's blog constantly and then I went to this event and there was Fred Wilson, you know, it's like. So Peter, you know, the funny thing is it also works in reverse too. So, and, and I don't know that everybody exercises this like lesson in humility, yeah. but like being the man, like in this startup world, yeah. there's people that come in behind you that like you'll want to ignore for that request for coffee or whatever it is. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're like angel investing and turning you down for, you know, you're the next thing that you want to start. So, you know, I think just uh, having that same perspective of like, okay, well, these people are still human and these people are still human. And being able to look on folks with their own merit is like, you know, great. Right, yeah. It's interesting that you bring up humanness and like, do you feel, do you feel like there are times when you have to remind yourselves or like people should remember like, hey, I'm actually interacting with humans on the internet? I don't think so. Uh, not in, I'm just saying for me personally, sure. right? Like I think uh, this is the best thing ever because you know, there's so many times where you know you know, where like your shrimp fork goes and like all these like kind of cordial things that ends up being quote unquote professionalism. But, you know, I feel like I'm in a, in a place now where the best thing I can do as a professional is just to be authentic. Hmm. Right, that's interesting. Like that, I don't, I don't know if you feel this way. It feels like a completely different business culture from let's say like the 1980s, 1990s, like MBA style of like you know suit and tie like i'm a professional like to be it to be authentic as a as part of being a successful business person seems to be a pretty new idea well there's still mores and customs and the same way like the 1990s mba right like there's still like the startup uniform <laughs> what are <you> talking about? <laughs> so but yeah like whether you're whether you're in a hoodie i think you know the good part is we're getting i think hopefully a little bit more fashionable as like startup people um 
But yeah, uh, again, right? Like it's like a, a give and take, right? Like you do need to ascribe to the culture and you do need to hold like to your own self. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you get to Techstars, you, uh, you know, you're doing this work, you're exposed to new culture, you become startup Sean. At what point does, uh, does the person who is just getting exposed to his idols for the first time actually say, all right, you know what? I'm actually gonna start my own thing. I'm gonna become, I'm gonna like, you know, go to this different level of being a co-founder of something. I love how Startup Sean sounds like a superhero. Um, <laughs> That's what I'm picturing so, in my head, honestly. Yeah. So, Spandex and like cake and everything. So in a world where there's a war on talent, and no, no. Um, <laughs> all right, so, you know, like, what ended up happening was, you know, we're working at Techstars, you do, uh, you know, pour your heart into all of the companies that come through each batch. And, you know, there's the mentorship, there's the part where they get a ton done and you facilitate and support them in that. And then they eventually go on the demo day stage to raise about a million and a half in venture capital. And, you know, in my opinion, I'm like, Techstars is pretty good at that. Like, it's, it's an average, it's a thing, it's a routine. They've, you know, kind of cemented it. But when you look at your position, um, in the tech ecosystem, you should always be saying like, okay, how can I give more? How can I give first? How can I, you know, pay this forward? And, um, you know, there were a couple of things that we, we saw and, you know, the talent issue was definitely one of them where they're like, you know what, that's, this is so great. We've closed around. I never thought I'd see this day. We popped the Martinelli's and then the next feeling that you have after that triumph is like panic. And you're like, oh my gosh, now these investors, they want me to grow yesterday. Um, how do I do that? Okay, well, I know I'll, um, I'll just hire some people. And if I hire people smarter than me, right, like I've read those management books, that's what you should do. Okay, so how do I find somebody that fits that profile? Hmm, think, think. Okay, I'm going to get a stack of resumes and I'm going to look and I'm going to see who went to MIT. Yeah, they rejected me. That guy must be smart. And he's got a 3.7 <laughs> and he used to work at Google. I love everything that Google does. Um, he's gonna be the best person for my company. Just hire him. But if you're not looking at how they actually fit culturally, if you're not thinking about you know, the, the passion and the alignment that they have, if you're not thinking about you know, just like how different the sushi and back rubs at Google is compared to your like, not sushi, not back rubs, is at your company, you know, there's gonna be a, a world's colliding moment. And you know, if you put yourself in a position to you know, have one too many of those, you know, misfit hires. Not bad people, just not right for your company. Right. You won't be a company anymore. So, you know, from that point is when, you know, we decided to, to solve that problem. And then we said, just kidding, we'll solve the problem with the community. And we looked back on all the, the friends and companies that had voices concern and said, well, what if we did a thing where you guys are very smart and you know, everything that's on the cutting edge of technology and innovation. Come, teach these people that want to learn it. Come and meet them, see what they're interested in. If it makes sense, then you can go and hire them. If not, you just made the community better and now there's people that are actually trained to do this rather than trying to break in with like the old resume and the old hat of like kind of like corporate uh, kind of recruiting and corporate hiring practices. How do you, uh begin to build a curriculum like I mean obviously if you, if you want to train people to become startup founders or startup employees you have to uh, eventually like actually build a process around that right like at some point you want to guarantee a certain output how do you go about figuring out what to teach someone uh, in order to work at a startup yeah so there's two pieces to it so the first part is the people and then the other part is continuing to listen. So, you know, when it comes to the people, uh, we do and take great care to interview a ton of individuals that want the opportunity to join the Startup Institute. Not all of them are the right fit, um, but it's being open to all the different profiles that allows us to have such a diverse set of backgrounds that come into it. So, you know, we, we do a lot to not just say like, okay, this young white guy with the flip-flops, come on in. 
um, because who knows where your next great kind of tech hire will come from. Um, the other side of the people are our instructors. So uh, these folks are all industry practitioners who are leading companies that are world class at what it is that we bring them in to teach. And we prepare them to, you know, they're great doers. Now how can you give and extract that piece of yourself so that others can learn from it? And then the, the part two of it is how do we know if that's right? And if it's right right now, how do we know that it stays right over time as everything continues to change? So we're consistently you know, keeping in touch with partner companies in the ecosystem to figure out you know, which tech kind of component is waning, which one is rising, how should we teach this, what can we get rid of, what should we start adding? And uh, we do that three times a year. Every single session, it's a, a new curriculum, effectively. And that's how we keep up. Gotcha. So if you can delve a little more into like, how do you actually choose, how do you figure out uh, what students to actually bring in, who to accept, and I guess a corollary to that is, um, like, is everyone equipped to work at a startup? Uh, like, are you purely limited by space, or are there actually people who just shouldn't work for a startup? Yeah, so when it comes to startup, uh, insofar as we are Startup Institute, um, you know, that moniker is starting to broaden itself, uh, where, you know, effectively, I guess the startup's kind of you, in the sense, right? And when you look at how the workforce is changing, um, it's less constrained to the whole argument of like, what, when is a startup not a startup? Well, you guys have money, or you know what you're doing, or you know, look at how many people work for you. But rather, you know, are they moving towards a place of ambiguity that could lead to you know, an ultimate kind of innovation or, or greater good? And you know, that exists in startups, that exists in scale-ups, that exists in social ventures. And you know, those places represent where a lot of our alumni have gone on to work. But backing up to who actually is the, the best person to come into Startup Institute, uh, you know, dealing with that, that ambiguity is huge. Having the emotional intelligence is huge. Um, you know, so, so often what we do is like a transformative experience. And for individuals that are so held on to being an accountant, and all they know is accounting, and if it doesn't fit over in this bucket, then it needs to fit over in that bucket. Mm -hmm. um, that can be a really sensitive place to start to change yourself, because you're like, if I've been an accountant for seven years, I'm not an accountant, who am I? Sure. So yeah. you know, I think a lot of those things, um, mixed in with you know, the fundamental skills to fit into the track that they apply into, um, you know, those are just the tip of the iceberg, but ultimately we're able to get, um, get to that point of who's the right fit in a series of conversations. Right, right. So you mentioned startup scale ups and social ventures. Are there, do you feel like as students actually go through your program, you can kind of pick people out and say, well, that person's probably a startup person. That person's a scale up person. I bet this person's going to go work for a social good company. Yeah, I do it by who's got good socks. Like, if your <laughs> socks are funky. No, no. <laughs> um, it really. It, it changes, you know. I think there's a lot of individuals that, um, you know, could come from an organization that's very bureaucratic, yeah. that's very rule based, that's very like, let's make money. Okay, the quarter's done. Let's make money. The quarter's done. Let's make money. And you're like, you know what? I'm just gonna leave here. I'm gonna join a nonprofit. I'm all about social good. And you'll come to notice that you get exposed to the community that, like, hey, maybe maybe that was a little short sighted. Maybe I just need to get out of there, right? And maybe there are, um, you know, brighter uh, and wider set of organizations that still, you know, start with the heart that may or may not be like a 501c3 or a B Corp. Yeah. If I show you my socks, will you tell me my future? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Yeah. They got some pretty crazy socks on. Today. Okay. All right. So they are funky. However, they look like they're very like well insulated. So pretty warm. So you believe in kind of like the security while still flare. I believe that your best fit is working on the side of innovation, but also with like a, a larger, more staid uh, company. How how far off am I? Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Okay. <laughs> Who's next? Anybody else? <laughs> you want to show us your socks? <laughs> 
I'll get to you later. I'll get to you later. <laughs> um, we can start opening it up for questions. Does anyone have a question just yet? You want to raise your hand? In the back there? Yeah, so I can everybody, reiterate the question. Can everybody hear the question? Yeah, so his question was, uh, do we at Startup Institute help on the tech side for folks that want to be uh, either product managers or build their own products but don't yet have that skill set? So, you know, there's a, a few components to Startup Institute. So our core accelerator goes incredibly fast. It's part of the transformative experience that gets people from, you know, one point to the next point in eight weeks. Um, that wouldn't be the best place if you're coming in without those fundamental skills uh, because it's like drinking from a fire hose. That said, we do have uh, part-time offerings that takes individuals that are highly motivated but just not yet initiated to that skill that they're looking to have. Um, so yeah, you know, our intro to Ruby would probably be a good place to start if you're looking to understand a little bit more about like object-oriented web development or design, et cetera. That, that might be an important distinction too, right? Because there Absolutely. are these comp there are like programs that are like hacker schools, and you go and you just like you know you just eat pizza and Red Bull and like learn how to build crazy shit. How do you distinguish like what's the difference between that versus Startup Institute? So we believe that there's just more. There's more to life. There's more to your role. There's more to the company. And you know when you think about that, I think you know ch chaining yourself to the desk with like a Red Bull and someone like sliding pizza underneath the door uh, until like your eyes bleed and you're like, I, I know I'm a developer now. <laughs> um, it's, it's not the full picture, you know, gone are the days, right? Like I think that was out, so to be honest, like if I tell you, I am, um, one of the degrees I walked away with from undergrad was a computer science degree. And that is the exact reason why I did not want to be a software developer as like my pure role, I was like terrified that I'm like, I'm gonna be a code monkey and they're gonna have me in the basement and they're not gonna let me leave <laughs> until like it's done. TPS reports over yeah. Time. And um, you know, I think that that model might kind of lend more to that olden days. But you know, here we're in a world where, you know, you've got software developers that are founding companies that need to not only like architect like their web infrastructure, but they need to architect how the company works and the processes and how the people interact. So to do that without a sense of like emotional intelligence, the bigger picture, you know, just doing code won't make you successful. Yeah. Cool. Uh, next question. Yeah, in the hat there. Yeah. Where are you from? You're from Germany? <laughs> okay, all right, so the question was, where, where do our folks come from? And the question is, or sorry, the answer is all around the world. Um, so, you know, our, you know, most run programs in the U.S. are in Boston, New York, and Chicago. Uh, we've also got outposts in London and Berlin, so there's your Germany for you. Um, but where they come from is actually quite wider than that. Um, we've had folks come from all around the world to do this, whether it's um, in America, in some of the European uh, locations. Because I, you know, and it was like surprising for us too, because initially when we first started uh, Startup Institute, which odd story was originally called Boston Startup School. Individuals came during our talent expo, which is like our, our final day where all of our students say, we're going out into the world you know, welcome us into, you know, this ecosystem. And it was CrowdTap, it was Lot18, there were these New York tech startups that came into our Boston Talent Expo. And the first question you ask is like, what are you, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it was the same kind of refrain, right? Like, there's a war on talent. Like, if I got to get on a train in the morning to get me a good guy, like, I'm definitely with it. And, you know, that, that still resonates on the company side, but I think it's still true with the, the students and our alum. You know, I think for the right opportunity to gain from and grow from this experience, um, you know, the, that whole ethos of wanting to do more, uh, it exists, 
you know, in the three cities we are, in the rural south, in the west coast, and mountain west, as well as other pieces around the world. So um, they're all over, and we're happy for that. It's so funny. I feel like I, we should get like a map and put a pin in every place where people are from. Do you, do you get a sense of um, how different uh, like talent needs are in different geographies? So like, how does Boston differ from New York City, from Chicago? How does that differ from like San Francisco versus Berlin? That's a good question. And do you guys actually try to adapt for that? Yeah, so the needs are still all around. Um, when you drill down to like our basic kind of four tracks. So it's the sales and account management, the technical marketing, the web design, and the web development. And the reason why we designed it in that kind of like simplistic way is because those four pillars represent what every company needs, whether they're at nascency or at scale. And when you build on that, you can only continue to go into like different niches and then maybe we'll say like, okay, well, you know, this particular you know, neighborhood may not need that many you know, product managers, but they may need more engineering managers. Or these people may not need that many biz dev people, but they definitely need more inside sales folk. And you know, those nuances are there, but at the end of the day, it still drills down to those top four. Gotcha. Next question. Oh, we got a mic now. <laughs> Is your mic hot? I don't think so. Oh. Not Can working. you hear me now? Yeah. Um, so how do you determine a niche for your startup? Check, check. Oh. oh. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. How do you determine a niche for your startup and how difficult was it to establish that niche? It wasn't very hard. Um, you start, I mean, you just be yourself, you know, and I think where we started from. So, you know, I think every company is going to be a manifestation of its founders and, and that founding story. And, you know, here I am, this big black guy. Um, you know, my other co-founder is, you know, a woman. Other co-founder, you know, Reed is like a more seasoned entrepreneur. And then there's Aaron, you know, who's like a young white guy. And when you start to look at, right, like a little bit of the gender diversity, the age diversity, the racial diversity, you, you start to create this kind of image that you usually don't see across the like about me team page, right? Where, you know, the same way that like, oh, if you, you're an owner, like you and your dog will start to favor, like your employees will start to look like you. But the fact that we're super different made it easy for folks to look at Startup Institute and say like, okay, if I'm, if I'm a, a brother or a sister, I could go there, look, they got a black guy in charge. Or like, or if I'm older and I'm like, well, I don't know, this, this place, they keep talking about it on the news, but that's for kids. No, I could be there. It, and you know, if I believe that there's gonna be a voice for women at the table, well, the ta look at who's at the head of the table. So, you know, those things I think put us on a very strong footing, um, as well as just the, the amount of heart and compassion that we have for you know, the journey that people are on. Rather than like, get a job that pays this many figures, start today, just give us your money. Um, it's, let's make a change in your life for the better. If you're willing to bust your ass with us, we will give you the spear, the shield, the slingshot, everything you need to be successful, but you have to go out there and do that and we're your number one champion. So I think for folks that can understand that message, very clearly appreciate our niche. Does having that same diverse team uh, cause friction as well? Does that cause issues? And I'm not just talking about like racial diversity or gender diversity, but diversity of perspective, diversity of background, uh, you know, and I'm thinking like with Snapchat, you can see how three like dude bros from the same frat are all on the same page about like every decision. Cause totally. Like, you guys want to do this? Yeah. All right. Cool. Like, does that? I mean, I'm sure that that diversity brings a lot of uh, value, but does it also cause tension? It, it's additive friction. Mm -hmm. I think when you can have an idea and you're open enough to accept another one, and the other one's like right at the same table as you, yeah. and you can say. You're right, I'm an idiot. Let's do that. <laughs> um, it's, it's magnificent, but unfortunately, I, you know, not many people get that chance to 
to embrace that much difference in plurality. And uh, it's easy as like humans to pattern match and to say like, okay, well, if I'm this type of person, who do I trust? I trust me. You look like me. I trust you. Let's do this. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I think difference of opinion, absolutely. Should those opinions be different? Absolutely. Yeah. Does it lead to better decision making? Absolutely. Um, if there are people in the audience looking for a co-founder right now, would you like actively say like look for someone with a different background than you? Look for someone with a different opinion, like someone who disagrees with you sometimes. Yeah. So they should be of the of the mindset that they can speak uh, their mind in front of you. Otherwise, you have just hired a clone, and you know you could have done it on your own. Um, they should be different, uh, also for the same clone perspective, but just also because. When you've had this idea and you've mitosized it into just two people, like you should cover as much ground as possible with that split um, and not overlap tremendously. And you know, from that point, you'll find whatever it is that is your, your methodology, whether it's like you know, the, the WAS and the jobs or the hacker, hustler, designer, the, you know, whatever you need to do to get your founding team up and running and then start to build in the direction that you need to fill your team in. So, someone used the phrase for me today, uh, hacker, hipster, hero, or something like that, as like a three-person team is interesting. Um, more questions from the audience? Over there. Oh. Yeah, sure, quick question. This might be self-serving, but <laughs> what is the common traits that you find very important? Are you saying you want to be a startup institute instructor? Is that what's happening right now? I oh, am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me a little about your background. I do uh, strategy and analytics. I'm teaching the analytics strategy next week, so I'm kind of curious. Okay, so what we look for in an instructor is like uh, a, a smooth brother of African descent with like a, <laughs> a shawl collar. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nah, you'll be in good shape. But no, so. <laughs> All right, so I'll do, and we'll go into the minutia since you asked for it. So, you know, I think just jumping in is the best thing. You know, I think a lot of times you're, you, there's this tension between both uh, the person coming in and the person that's looking to absorb to where you do tap dance a little bit around it and you're like, oh, well, tell me about your background. And then it's like the 17th time that these people have talked about their backgrounds um, when really they care more about you than themselves. So to tell them about you and then to start doing work and explain the pieces and the thought processes that go into that piece of work um, allows them to then get their hands dirty and then think about it the same way you think about it and then ask questions so that they can refine um, their path to a way that's more closer to yours and ideally in a way that they'll ask questions that you can't answer because you've been gisting it because you're so masterful at what you do that it's just like, oh no, you just do it because you do it like this. And um, you know, you'll leave knowing that there's a, a more explicit way to go about the things that you do, and maybe you can bring that back to the other people at your job. Yeah. Awesome. More questions? Yeah, right here in the front. Can you tell us about a couple of people that have come through the program that have, whose lives have been radically transformed? <laughs> this is like or, my favorite or just mildly part. transformed. Oh man! All right. So who do I love talking about? Um, this is your politician moment. This is where you hold up the picture of like. I'm gonna kiss a baby. I'm gonna kiss you. a baby tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, dude, there's Gemma Fay. So Gemma uh, loves math. Uh, she loves it so much that she got a DPhil from the University of Oxford in mathematics, and that's kind of the end of the road, right? Once you <laughs> love math that much and knew that she didn't want to be you know, an academic, but was like, well, what the hell do I do next? And she was able to come to the Startup Institute, take her you know, quantitative rigor and love for that, and um, you know, coming out of the technical marketing track, was able to leave uh, as a uh, quantitative marketer for Boundless Learning, which is like an ed tech startup in Boston. Um, geez, dev-wise, so there's Bryce Lim, so Bryce, uh, he's actually an engineer here at Spotify. And you know, he plays music, he loves music, um, but you know, he came to grow 
into his passion while also growing into this passion that he just discovered, which was coding. And he increased his coding skills and was able to use his creativity to actually stand out in front of the sea of people that want to work at Spotify, which who doesn't? And um, you know, he actually made his resume into basically a, a, a version of the Spotify player. So you could like skip through the tracks of his experience and uh, it was like mega creative. Um, you know, we, you know, we now go over to Spotify as like a, a relationship inside the program, and um, you know, they still talk about it today. And they're like, "Yeah, we sent that thing to you know all the way to Europe, and like everybody's like talking about them." And uh, you know, naturally, he got the job. Um, yeah, I mean, I could literally go on and on about these people, but anyway, so. It, Mariko Kosaka, I'll give you another one. So she's actually probably one of the, the weirder ones um, because of how dynamic she is. Uh, so she came through our sales track, um, used her sales ability to actually persuade not outside of the company, but inside of the company, and took a product management role at Live Intent. Um, after doing that and getting a ton of people with differing opinions that control different parts of a specific product to march in one line towards shipping, after that, she decided that um, you know, as a member of the team, she wanted to contribute as much as she could, and she started teaching herself how to code while she was there. From that point, she built all of these tools just to make them more efficient, and then ended up going and taking a role as an internal tools engineer at Percolate because of that passion. How she found that wasn't just like chucking a resume. She actually like, used the whole like, circumspect piece of like, being a whole person started speaking at uh, JavaScript meetups about what she was like, very passionate about and how adept she is at like, telling her story and writing and like, proving it, uh, ended up helping her get that opportunity. And then, I mean, she's a rock star. But uh, yeah, we're super proud of those folks. So those are excellent stories. I guess the next question would be, like, how many people actually going through the program uh, can mirror or match those stories? Like how many people are actually getting jobs coming out of the program? That's a great question. So recently uh, we completed an, uh, an outside audit of our outcomes. And the reason why was because, you know, this, this form of education is blowing up, right? Like whether you're looking at coding boot camps or, um, you know, other like teach yourself to do X, Y, Z thing, uh, there's more out there than just universities and you know universities are beholden to like say like these are the people that get jobs and these are average salaries and this is how fast it happens um, but unfortunately in this realm uh, the thing that we're beholden to is putting the front page of the website with whatever the fuck you want to put out there that seems alluring enough to get people to say oh I want a six-figure salary click and um, you know that it's not it's not great because I think individuals deserve to know uh, what they're getting in for, um, you know, on some level, like I don't actually believe in statistics, because if you think that you are a person that always falls on the the fattest part of the bell curve, like, right? I see you, right? Like, so you know, on some level, you should be like, oh, well, ninety nine percent of people don't get jobs. Well, I ain't gonna be the one, or like something like that, right? Like, but um. You know, so we ended up publishing them, and we talked about velocity, we talked about satisfaction, we talked about uh, a lot of uh, those results, and you can check them out online, but, you know, the net is, um, you know, we get to, you know, well up into the 80s after 90 days, and, you know, after 100 days of doing that last audit, uh, we actually got to 90, so, um, you know, we're really su successful at what we do. Uh, I think for, you know, the, those that aren't publishing those stats, and we're kind of first in class at doing this, so we hope that there's a lot of people that follow. Um, yeah, I just think it's necessary. You think, I mean, you know, as you're describing this sort of like, you know, six figure salary, like come to this school, it sounds like, I mean, a lot of colleges and universities use those kind of stats too, right? It's like, oh, you know, 95% of people who graduate from University of Phoenix make a million dollars. You know, and like, <laughs> not you know, I'm not calling out University of Phoenix, but I kind of am actually. Um, does it, you know, do you think that you're dinged somehow by actually just being open and transparent as opposed to doing the big like marketing shtick? No, I think that there's something to being 
first and being honest. And a lot of times honesty hurts in the beginning because you're like, well, all these other people say that they'll do this. And I'm like, mm, did they prove it? <laughs> Can they say it? Like, right. so, you know, and I, I do believe that there's something about putting it out there and being okay with that result. And, you know, the, is it 100% like you just sit back and give us your money and all of a sudden you like go to the mailbox and a job's waiting for you? It's not, it's not that program. Um, you know, and it's, it's part of the reason why we want to interview and meet people so, you know, uh, intensely. But um, I, I think we're fine with it. You know, I, our, our cohorts have been intimate individuals that go through a shared experience. And I think that there's something about how high our word of mouth is um, that ends up continuing to perpetuate that outside of what someone would see on just making a decision on everyone's homepage. Uh, more questions? Viewer? Yeah, right here. So how do you coach students on their personal narrative? Yeah. Like, yeah. So it's, it's part and parcel of how we finish the program. Uh, so that is Talent Expo. So Talent Expo, uh, we get a room full of about 200 companies that are, you know, represent the fastest growing companies in New York. They're all looking to grow their teams. They're looking to the stage to meet all of our grads. And they have 60 seconds to tell their story uh, as our students to say, this is me. This is what I've learned at Startup Institute. This is the value that I want to provide. And uh, you know, it's very polarizing on purpose. Because in the crowd, there should be individuals that say, that person's amazing, not really looking for that person though. Or that person's amazing, get in my company now. And you know, how do we get there? Uh, it's coaching. You know, there's a, an explicit piece in the last week to coach people to get that narrative down, but it all happens from the beginning of the program. So from you know, looking at your online footprint, whether it's your LinkedIn, your resume, uh, we'll review those components with all of our students. Um, but just to elevate the conversation a little bit, I believe that regardless of what it is that you've done that you think is so orthogonal that you just rather strike it from your resume and don't tell anybody that you ever had that job, that there's some semblance that made you take that job. There's something that tied into the true narrative of you even if it isn't tied directly into the title, that you can say, okay, so why did I work at Deutsche Bank in like the derivatives market? Well, you know, I do believe that there's hidden value in other, right? And you can go with wherever that narrative takes you so long as it is authentic and bridge it into the thing that you're currently doing and the thing that you want to do. And now it's that line and that trajectory that, you know, the employer, the guy in the elevator that you're pitching to, um, will be able to see and see the true you rather than rattling off, well, I used to work here, then I worked there, then I was major, then you got a job? <laughs> Give me. <laughs> well, so, talked about the past, talked about the present. Uh, why don't we finish off by kind of getting into the future. What, where do you think Startup Institute's going? Uh, you know, are, do you consider yourselves to be a high growth company? Have you taken venture capital? Um, where, you know, where are you gonna be in five years? Yes, so uh, though we bootstrap for some time, we have taken on venture capital. So that same moment of like, yeah, now we have to grow yesterday. Um, we do want to grow. We want to help more people. Uh, we want to you know, be in more places. We want to offer uh, different offerings that allows us to solve you know, this, this much larger problem, which isn't you know, how many people can we crank through you know, our doors, um, but actually just continuing to peel back that onion and ask the question of like, why is this a problem that needs to be solved in general? And you know, part of it has to do with how we look at careers. Part of it has to do with where we go to get initially educated and the amount of uh, pressure and responsibilities that are squarely put there that like, I'm gonna go here in four years, they'll give me a job, they'll mature me, they'll grow me up, they'll tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do with my life and if they don't, 
then I'll go back and I'll get a master's and then that'll help me get these things. So, you know, I, I think that there's some things that can be changed in education. I think that there can be some things that can be changed in career, uh, as well as just like organizational behavior in general. So that, um, you know, starting from HR, as you look at what talent is, that it isn't solely a pattern matching game. It isn't solely a numbers game with a stack of resumes. Um, and that once you get these individuals into your company that you can, you know, nurture, you know, how well they fit the culture as well as celebrate their uniquenesses and, you know, continue to thrive from there. So, you know, I think those are broad strokes on the things that we'll continue to tackle in 2016 and beyond. Um, but Sean, one more super quick question for you. Oh, uh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, just, again, looking into the future, you know, what are you excited about in 2016? What do you, what do you hope to see by the end of the year? Oh man, so year. I, all right, so this is kind of where people give that whole like fuzzy, like every, hugs and everything. <laughs> I'll actually tell you one thing. So you can say drones if you want to say drones. <clears throat> no, so in the Obama administration, um, the Department of Education is actually uh, going really hard to create uh, an initiative that in their last year could be the best thing that they've ever done. So it's called the EQIP program. And what it does is it takes institutional higher education uh, institutions and allows them to uh, adopt a lot of the new forms of education like Startup Institute does into their uh, pretty much system of learning, right. um, leveraging uh, financial aid as an incentive to do it. Wow. So, you know, those are very broad strokes. Um, if you guys are as interested as I am about it, check it out. Uh, but I think that that could be a tremendous thing if all the good that we do can actually live inside universities um, because there's still homes for them and a place for folks that want to go to colleges. But uh, to have the outcomes that we've delivered at Startup Institute coming out of university would be amazing. Is there a specific date that that starts or a kickoff? Or yeah, so 12-14 is the letter of intent, which it, it's just boring dates that you guys shouldn't care about. But February is when the proposals go in. And then uh, you should see the movement happen in the Obama administration. So you know there's like one more year left right. uh, in his reign. So uh, yeah, awesome. cross your fingers. Cool. Well, Sean, thank you so much for your time and for joining us. We really appreciate it.